Okay, well, let's get started. All right, here we go. Good afternoon uh, and welcome to today's Doors Open Baltimore event. It's presented by the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. I'm Rob Brennan, a past president of the BAF, a member of the Doors Open Planning Committee and a co-chair of AIA Historic Resources Committee. Uh, thank you to everyone who donated to be with us and thank you to our Doors Open sponsors, grantors and in-kind supporters as you see on your screen here. Through your support, we've been able to host free doors open programs nearly every day this month, quite an incredible undertaking. Uh, we encourage you to make a donation so that we can continue delivering free virtual programs. Today's program is the first program of Doors Open Baltimore Spiritual Week. Actually, maybe more than the first, might be the second. Um, and final week of Doors Open Baltimore. I hope you can also join us tomorrow afternoon for a presentation on the Westminster Hall <clears throat> burial ground. See those and all doors open offerings at www.doorsopenbaltimore.org. Uh, I also encourage everyone to participate in our Instagram at home photo contest. We'd love to see photos of buildings around your neighborhood. Uh, use the hashtag doors open Baltimore to participate. The contest ends on October 31st and prizes are available. Um, let's see, and now uh, today's presentation, um, we are joined by Jeremy Cargan, an architect with CRGA Design uh, and formerly uh, of Morgan State University uh, School of Architecture, who has uh, conducted extensive research on post-World War II religious buildings, particularly in Baltimore. Uh, the AIA Historic Resources Committee uh, had as our 2020 focus post-war modernism <clears throat> as a nod to the AIA BAF relocation to the new Center for D Architecture and Design in the Mies van der Rohe Charles Center building. The center is opening virtually this Friday at 2 p.m. Uh, the history of the development of Charles Center is being uh, presented at 1 p.m. And again, you can follow both those events at doorsopenbaltimore.org. Uh, if you have questions for Jeremy, please add them to our chat box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. So Jeremy, uh, it's yours. All right. Okay, well, let me see if I can uh, uh, share my screen here. I think I'm going to unshare you and then share myself. Here we go. And uh, bear with me here, share screen and do all that all right okay can you see my splash screen there interesting image uh so so thank you very much uh rob and nathan for putting this together for me and uh inviting me to speak and i want to thank all of you in the audience uh for wanting to share this material even if uh, we're only doing it virtually today uh what i'll be presenting is a synopsis of a chapter in, in this book a uh, book by the author uh, Anat Geva, uh, Modernism and American Mid-Century uh, Sacred Architecture, which was uh, published last year by Routledge. She uh, invited a number of authors to come and write on their favorite topics, and I was um, lucky enough to be one of them. Uh, but before I begin, I wanted to explain how I got into this topic, uh, because in truth, as a scholar, I was really happy in the 19th century, and I had promised myself that I would stay there. Um, in fact, uh, after reviewing uh, Charles Belfort's uh, book on Edmund Lind, the architect of the Peabody Library, I got a little bit involved in Edmund Lind's color notation, uh, which was uh, quite an interesting topic in itself. And I also learned a little bit about his journals. Uh, he was, a, as a young man, in, as a young architecture student in London, he wrote extensively about um, what he saw on his walks around London, including uh, the ecclesiastical architecture that he was involved in. And so I thought I would publish that as a critical edition. Um, I thought about Latrobe also, and uh, just the best thing about the 19th century is that there are no copyright permission problems. So you know, everybody has been dead long enough not to care. So as I mentioned, I tried to stay in the 19th century until I became interested in Joseph Evans Sperry's work uh, for the Jewish community. Uh, you may know Joseph Evans Sperry as the architect of the Broma Seltzer Tower, uh, but as you may also know, uh, he was responsible for designing the four major Bolton Hill synagogues in the 1890s. And so I wanted to explore how one designer engaged a single building type with four very different results. 
So I started to dig around in the archives, uh, but I was frustrated to discover that uh, although two congregations kept very good records, uh, in fact, it was all in German, not English, um, there was very little architectural material extant, at least among the papers that I could access. Uh, but an arch archivist told me one day, we have a lot of material from the synagogue we built in the 1950s. Okay, my you know, historian's eyes got much wider, wider and sure enough, uh, she was right. Uh, without belaboring the point, um, I found an embarrassment of riches located in the files of Baltimore's churches and synagogues uh, that were built after World War II. And I realized also how great they were in their own right as architecture. We'll talk today about Church of the Redeemer, which I think most of you may know about, uh, but I discovered that every church and synagogue built during that period after World War II um, has a great story to tell. Uh, some of you may have attended the exhibit uh, that I put on at the D Center in 2013, Baltimore's Modernist Religious Buildings. Uh, and that project uh, and the course I taught also at the same time at Morgan allowed me to document a broad selection of them. So what follows is a deep dive into one particular aspect of that architecture. And of course, this is what scholarship does to reveal concepts and ideas that lie behind buildings shared characteristics. Uh, in doing so, I will tell a number of stories that were known then, but mostly forgotten now. In particular, I will relate the story of modern art and architecture's calculated promise to facilitate new patterns of life and even new patterns of faith. So let's begin. I'd like to go back uh, to uh, 1958, uh, the year the AIA planned a series of promotional films to educate the general public about what architects do. And the titles of these films were like Biz Buildings for Business or A School for Johnny. Um, and among these films, the AIA also produced this film, A Place to Worship, which evoked current trends in religious architecture throughout the United States. The film's producers uh, echoed the unmistakably modernist credo that, quote, mere imitation of past periods is out of place, unquote. So here is an image of Anshin and Allen's Chapel of the Holy Cross from Arizona. And over this image, the film's narrator explains, quote, a religion which is firmly anchored in the life of our day is best expressed by the architecture of the day, unquote. And the film illustrates this for its audience in the following manner. And let's hope that the uh, film clip works. Today, we live in a period of accelerated change in the whirl of a technological revolution with all its untold human consequences. Our architecture is changing too, an architecture partly born of a new rapidly progressing building technology and partly determined by our new emphasis on the individual family and its material, emotional, and spiritual needs. So as you just heard, uh, the narrator puts it, building technology and the needs of the family are two significant influences upon architecture but both result from a more basic concern. Today, we live in a period of accelerated change in the world of a technological revolution with all its untold human consequences. Now, this is, of course, a familiar verbal trope used for more than a century in Europe and the United States to describe the character of contemporary society. Its connection with religion and spirituality has been contentious and varied, sometimes pitting traditional religion in opposition to technological development and sometimes calling for their reconciliation. In this case, the AIA's film leaked a kind of perceptual gestalt to the challenge of understanding our technology-based culture, but that gestalt was shown literally framed within an architectural setting. A place to worship alludes therefore to a visual strategy by which contemporary designers sought to engage the world of a technological revolution. Now, the strategy was implemented in part through engagement with the decorative arts, among other innovations in American religious architecture after World War II. Earlier architects' ostensible rejection of ornament was reinterpreted by some as a call to rebuild the relationship between art and its community. Others called instead for simply the reintroduction of art in a more up-to-date style, as you can see here. As a consequence, religious art's literal place within architectural space received renewed attention from architects who often had to balance spiritual atavism with new norms of behavior, as well as changing materials and construction practices. So I've proposed calling this visual strategy 
opticalism. Okay, and that's a neologism, which denotes the use of dominating large scale visual effects within spaces of worship. I'm probably channeling my inner Klaus Herdeg, whose book, The Decorated Diagram, identified a relationship between visual figure and meaning in Bauhaus inspired pedagogy. Um, Herdeg was a teacher of mine and uh, that book, The Decorated Diagram, is one of the best uh, 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 you know, scholarly and popular analyses of what went wrong with modern architecture that I know of. Uh, in any case, you know, he, picks on, he picks on the uh, influence of the Bauhaus and the GSD at Harvard, but that's not my story here. Instead, by my definition, opticalism typically includes the following characteristics. The sp spatial centrality of decorative installations of, a new, of an unusually stimulating nature, and more importantly, the spatial dissociation of religious, religious symbol from the primary visual effect. In addition, I'm, I'm, opticalism connotes newness, if not the actual use of recently developed technology. In other words, I propose that opticalism does indicate a process of innovation, but that uh, the innovation is not primarily technological. Rather, the innovation was semiotic, having to do with, the, uh, with attenuating the relationship between image and symbol. So getting to architecture, in these three buildings that I'll be uh, talking about today, the certainty of symbolic meaning, what, is that, what does that thing that I'm seeing represent, is increasingly displaced by the tendency towards abstraction, and, I, and that's, of course, that's modernism, but also by the use of optical effect to define sacred space. A strikingly aggressive visual counterpoint to what theologian Paul Tillich called holy emptiness was the result common to many regional churches and even synagogues of that era. So for example, explicit questions about image and symbol lie at the center of the design process for Pietro Belusky's uh, Church of the Redeemer, which was commissioned in 1954 and completed in 1958. This wonderful building has been well documented in the critical literature uh, most comprehensively by Meredith Clausen in her book on Belusky's religious architecture. As you all know, as you may know, if you've gone inside, Redeemer's warm and sober interior is defined primarily by the rhythm of Belusky's sim signature timber arches that you can see in the background there. Uh, but the space is brought to life by the effect of the stained glass chancel screen, which was designed by Belusky's MIT colleague, Georgi Kepish. The scale of the chancel screen is immense and filling, it fills an entire structural bay. Kepish at the time personally selected the colors and arrangements. Now he had been invited by the architect when this very early scheme was uh, rejected as too austere. As eventually designed and installed, the chancel screen is anything but austere, it scintillates with color. In white light, the figure of the cross may be seen to emerge from the random pattern of the color. You gotta blur your eyes a little bit. Even once one perceives the cross, however, the limits of its arms and its base are hard to discern. Uh, the ensemble, luminous, uh, appears to float, uh, and the cross itself barely rises to one's attention. So what I called earlier a process of symbolic dissociation is here already visible, if incomplete. Uh, the rector at the time of construction, a guy named Reverend Bennett Sims, recalled how much that bothered him. It really bothered him. And he wrote in a memoir, quote, when the screen was installed, the designer, Professor Kepish, came to see the finished work. I walked with him down the center aisle. Halfway down, I said to him, trying to be polite but definite, why did you design the cross in the window as an apology? It is so muted and indistinct that no one will see it without direction and straining." Unquote. He turned to me and he scoffed, ha, you Americans, you don't know the difference between a sign and a symbol. All you seem to want are signs like Coca-Cola and mobile gas. They are so shallow that you grasp them in an instant and they never endure in your inner life. But a symbol is radically different. You don't grasp it, it grasps you. It asks for your deep attention and that attention, and once that attention has been given, the symbol will take hold of your soul and feed you in new ways each time you encounter it. It is the mystical character of all true art. And that's the end of uh, Kepish's uh, screed. Uh, but Reverend Sim uh, does add, I felt both rebuked and enriched, which is probably a polite way of uh, putting it. So Kepish's distinction between sign and symbol and the tactical consequences of that distinction is fundamental to the artist's influential theoretical writing, starting with the language of vision 
in uh, 1944. In that book, Kepesh promoted his program of dynamic iconography, which he defined as the reconciliation between the image in its original role as a sense-based experience and the meaningful signs of visual relationships, very much in, um, in uh, the, the tradition of art history and the relationship between iconography and the structure of a composition. In Church of the Redeemer, symbol and sign obviously coexist, subject to Belusky's effective choreography in the space. And I think this picture gives a good sense of that. As you can see here, they did add a second crucifix suspended above the altar in front of the chancel screen. And, uh, but this cross is just one of many of the religious fittings in this, uh, in this area, um, and including the altar is, itself. Um, at Redeemer, what's going on here is that the it, symbol and sign are reconciled, but it's mediated through ritual. Explicit religious signs are incorporated primarily into objects used repeatedly every day within the sacred precinct, uh, which spatially is defined almost entirely by that glass wall. Now, other architects and other sects also sought a similar kind of reconciliation. Now, in the next example, um, which is uh, a Baltimore's Reform Synagogue Har Sinai, the design's development suggests a process by which a functionally derived architectural form is replaced by a symbolically charged one, something that means more, something that uh, eventually does transform considerably in its own right. And the result of that process was a stunning faceted suspended ceiling, recalling what the architect Erich Mendelssohn once called Tellurian and planetary things. So I, I mentioned Erich Mendelssohn, the German architect, because he does come across in this story. Uh, this is a newspaper article what, from 1953 or so uh, that uh, talks about the initial design for the suburban site, uh, which they call a contemporary multi-purpose building of flexible design. Um, 1953, there were really very, almost there were really no examples of modernist religious architecture, um, except for um, actually two designs. One was for Percival Goodman's um, Baltimore Hebrew congregation, which is just uh, north of this building, and Erich Mendelssohn's uh, Beth El Synagogue, uh, which uh, was never never realized because Mend Mendelssohn's desk, death that same year, 1953, uh, cut short that project. Nevertheless, I want to emphasize Mendelssohn's presence in Baltimore because as you'll see, it has an impact on Har Sinai. Anyway, the next year, uh, 1954, they bring on the firm uh, Buckler, Fenhagen, Meyer and Ayers, which we now know today as Ayers St. Gross, uh, to produce alternative designs uh, quite different from the picture, uh, the project illustrated in 1953. So here's a first version. Um, and I, I guess the architects didn't get the memo about synagogues not having steeples, because you can see the steeples there on the left. Um, uh, and then he, they, they iterate through a few different designs, including this one, which I think is interesting, uh, interestingly reminiscent of one of Wright's uh, Usonian houses. Uh, but here is scheme number three, uh, a circular sanctuary surrounded by classrooms flanked to the right by the social hall. Um, and as you can see from this rendering, uh, the precedent is, is obvious. Um, Park Synagogue, uh, rather in, in Cleveland, uh, was the model for, the Baltim for Baltimore's local architects who wanted to <laughs> create a very, very close copy. Uh, Park Synagogue at the one on the upper right was designed by Eric Mendelssohn, was completed 1952, I think. And so it was obviously uh, well published in the literature around that time. Um, and they share obvious similarities, a big dome, a wedge shaped thing that's inserted into it. But the two projects could hardly be more different at the interior. Whereas the inside of Mendelssohn's dome it feels like a quasi platonic form. It's entirely smooth, uh, it's flawless. Uh, Har Sinai's dome is aggressively tessellated. Here, direct illumination enters from the clever story, as you can see here on the left of, these, of this sketch here. Um, and this promotional pamphlet explained that, quote, the great dome has a many faceted interior ceiling to aid in acoustics, light distribution, and striking appearance. So acoustics ostensibly is a rationale, a functional rationale for what the architects wrought, but acoustical considerations alone could not account for the faceted dome's startling impact. And here's a collage I made at the time. It, it's impossible to grasp the totality of the effect of this, of this interior. If you crane your neck to stare directly up, you have difficulty locating the perimeter of this dome. This visual field pulsates like a moiré pattern, alternating light and dark. Um, 
the experience evokes a biblical no notion, this idea of a taut yet energetic firmament. Um, now, considering the way the folds of the soffit are continued by the mullions of the clerestory glass at the dome's base, the pattern also recalls uh, Buckminster Fuller's geodesic domes, which were patented in 1954 and published in the architectural press the same year. But the steel members here are obviously non-structural. And here's a peek behind the screen. The dome is, is actually concrete. So uh, what you see is artifact, artifice, not, not uh, sort of this modernist um, uh, truth of materials. The, the, uh, the residual star figure at the um, apex of the dome relates to no obvious symbol, uh, except perhaps an implicit orientalism of so many rotational tilings, but that's hard to credit here. The impact of Harsini's soffit, in my opinion, in my opinion, is not unlike the op art of the succeeding decade, sharing, as historian Frank Popper put it, the effect of dazzle, reversible perspective, and the superpos superposition of elements in space. It really is a mind-blowing experience. Now, in a similar fashion, the sacred space, um, in my final example, defies expectations uh, that you might, you know, come to, come to it uh, by its milieu. Uh, St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran of Glen Burnie is situated in the southeast Baltimore, southwest uh, Baltimore suburbs, outside city limits. Uh, to accommodate their fast-growing membership in the late 1950s, St. Paul's leadership commissioned a Chicago area uh, architectural office, Charles E. Stade, uh, a guy who had very strong connections to the Missouri Synod of the Lutheran Church. So this was a project that was sort of establishment uh, Lutheran and uh, finally dedicated in 1963. Um, this church is included in an uh, interesting survey of other churches of this, of, of this architect and two other architects by uh, Gretchen Bugeln, uh, The Suburban Church. It's a book that I show in my bibliography. I definitely recommend it to this audience. Uh, and as she writes, this church was typical of Stade's work. It was an A-frame structural system, had a long nave. And as you can see here on the left, a sculptural facade behind which lay the chancel. It was completely typical, except for this one exceptional interior feature. And here you can see the exterior. This is the feature I'm talking about, a backlit translucent marble screen called a reredos throughout the written record of its planning. Uh, in fact, this word reredos is not a word with which I'm, I was familiar, uh, but those who are familiar with ecclesiastical buildings might know that a reredos is a decorative altarpiece or screen uh, behind the altar. This Reredos, this screen, transforms St. Paul's interior in a manner unprecedented in Stade's work or among Lutheran churches at that time. The illuminated marble places all these traditional chancel fittings, including the, the cross and the suspended lamp, in sharp relief. It's hard to overemphasize the Reredos' impact upon the visual experience within the church, and it's harder still to identify a more significant visual innovation in church architecture from that period. St. Paul's translucent marble reredos actually predates the obvious secular precedents like SOM's Beinecke Library uh, and recalls instead non-luminous examples of marble pattern matching like um, at Mies van der Rohe's domestic projects or you'll see this in, um, in reliquaries uh, designed later in the 20th century. And its impact has partly to do with its size like Kepish's glass screen at Church of the Redeemer the reredos extends from the floor to the underside of the roof structure. Now, files maintained by the church do show extensive discussion among church leadership, art, architect, artisans, and even a guy whose title is the ecclesiologist, uh, prominent religious artist Ernst Schwitter. And they talk uh, about all the other elements of the chancel, including the pulpit, the lectern, the altar carving, and the carved figure of Christ, a sketch for which you see here. Uh, the scope and detail of that concern is obvious, and the articulateness with which all the parties discuss uh, both religious and materials issues is exceptional. This was a very, uh, if not well-educated, a very sophisticated group of thinkers uh, at the uh, congregation and, of course, um, among the professionals they hired. But the Reredos itself defied thematic integration with the rest of, of the chancel. Uh, at the time of the, uh, the church's dedication, Charles Stade, the architect, referred to the Reredos only once with the following very modest words. The white, quote, the white marble Reredos reaching from floor to ceiling identifies the chancel space. 
And he didn't go on to explain what that meant. You know. um, however, some Baltimore architects gave it a shot. And in fact, this building received a merit award from AIA Baltimore. And at the time, 1963, the jurors had this to say, quote, through the use of a transparent marble reredos, a sense of opaque openness is affected around the altar. This boundary of light establishes the visual climax and the focal point of worship in the Lutheran rite, unquote. In other words, the reredos serve primarily to define visually a precinct, not just of space, but of space's sacredity, sacred space. The religious leader of this congregation, um, the Reverend Paul Dannenfeldt, he repeatedly used the word symbology to describe the church's ensemble of ritual objects uh, that had explicit religious contact, content. And you can see them here. The Reredos was obviously part of the symbology, but it was difficult for him and for everybody else at St. Paul's to find words appropriate for explaining how. Its visual patterns teased at associations, none of which were intended by him or by the ecclesiologist or by the architects for that matter. Uh, years, years later, about 20 years later, the um, Dannenfeldt was interviewed for a, sort of a testimonial uh, of the church's construction. And he mentions this quote, many people have seen different faces or different symbology here, but there was nothing intentional. And so whether you see the Trinity or whether you see the face of Jesus, it's simply accidental, unquote. Dannenfeld attributed the concept to the architect and added, quote, this was a totally new idea at the time and he was waiting for the right church to start it and we stuck our, our next way out to subscribe to this in our new sanctuary. We are so glad we did because it is truly beautiful. Okay. So getting towards the conclusion, uh, these three projects, what is the historical thread uh, that connects them? Well, we know that they share roughly location you know, in Baltimore City or its close suburbs, as well as generally the same place in time, late 1950s, early 1960s. They had three different architects, one who was internationally famous, Pietro Beluski, one who was well known in his region, Charles Stade, and one firm that was local to Baltimore, Myers and Ayers. And then there was Georgi Kepish. His work at the Church of the Redeemer led to other Baltimore projects of the next decade, including installations in religious buildings, public sculpture, art exhibits, and even road graphics. They brought him down here for a lot. Uh, we can discern Kepish's influence in projects inspired by Redeemer's chancel scream on the left, and more generally, in the local public's reception of modernism in the decorative arts. Mostly, though, I think what these projects share is opticalism, as I've defined it the presence of large scale decorative effects which dominate the central spatial experience of their architecture. Taken as a sequence from left to right, these three projects depict the unfolding of that semiotic process that's at the heart of my definition, the literal dissociation of religious symbol from visual effect. And so this is the core of my message. Attention to the decorative arts of this period points to the same process as an architectural strategy in religious buildings. So look at the, follow the art. Don't follow the money, follow the art. Now, of course, we also have three different religious communities. And so I'd like in conclusion to refer again to theologian Paul Tillich, whose concept of holy emptiness I mentioned in passion, uh, passing uh, earlier. Paul Tillich was the public intellectual most visible to American church architects in the mid to late 1950s. His talk, Theology and Architecture was published in Architectural Forum. And so he actually had a nat national platform from which to address architects. Tillich told his audience directly, quote, probably the way modern religious art will be reborn is through architecture, unquote. Now, his importance to what I'm calling opticalism has to do with asking his readers, and that included Pietro Beluski and artists like Georgi Kepish, who were collaborators also of Paul Tillich and other projects, he, he asked these people the questions, what is faith? And also, what is faith not? Tillich did so by relating these questions to sense perception and to the certainty afforded by seeing as opposed to knowing. In particular, Tillich likened seeing to religious faith. He who, and this is a quote from him, he who sees a green color sees a green color and is certain about it. He cannot be certain whether the thing is really green, but he cannot doubt that he sees green. Unquote. He continued in another place, uh, quote, the certitude of faith is existential. Its certitude is not the uncertain certitude of a theoretical judgment, unquote. 
So the semiotic innovation of opticalism appears to me to have been based on just this operation, seeing, not, not knowing. These large scale installations were conceived to provoke that leap of faith. And that leap of faith was founded first of all in visual sensation. Now, not long after Tillich addressed the architectural forum in 1955, Georgi Kepish, our artist at the Church of the Redeemer, made a similar point to an audience at NYU. To summarize, it went something like this. Industrial civilization has torn us apart from the relatedness that people knew in a smaller world. We have to build bridges within ourselves to reach an inner oneness, a union of our sensory, emotional, and symbolic aspects of our life. What inner guide do we have to meet this task? The philosopher Alfred North Whitehead described religion as a world loyalty, but in a certain sense, artistic experience leads us also to a world loyalty. And by experiencing it, we are bound with deep loyalties to our total horizon. I think for Kepish and for all of us who might experience directly the effect of opticalism in these churches and synagogues, that total horizon defines a, a, a profound place to worship. Thank you very much. That's uh, where I'll bring this to a close. Uh, to a close. Um, I'll be able to share the uh, bibliography with anybody who puts in a sort of a request. I can follow up with an email later this week. And I'd like also to acknowledge um, my contacts at the Church of the Redeemer, uh, the former, um, the former Harsinai, now based at Israel School for Girls, St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church, my colleagues at Morgan State University, and everybody else on that list. So uh, thank you very much, and I'll Great. open well, it up to you. questions. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so I'll, I'll start with one. Uh, so opticalism, uh, would you equate that with spirituality, the sort of the intangible experience of? Well, I religion? think that the architectural, I mean, the, 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 the architectural um, mechanism of what I'm calling opti opticalism uh, should inspire or provoke or bring about uh, spirituality in those who experience it. I, um, I'm not a spiritual person, you know, <laughs> so I, I can't answer that from personal experience, but I do know that I'm moved emotionally and uh, in other meaningful ways uh, by the experience of these spaces. Okay, thank you. Um, so the first question here from Rochelle Cohen is, uh, could you briefly discuss Gropius and Oeb Shalom right down the street? From yeah, yeah, Gropius and Oheb Shalom. I mean, there, there was a moment in time that uh, congreg religious congregations in Baltimore were fascinated and, and, and in fact inspired by the possibility of innovation, architectural innovation, but also other kinds of innovation because they knew that things were changing fast in, the, in America in the 1950s. Um, Survivorization was obviously something that that film talked about. The, uh, the film that we saw, AIA, um, you know, uh, the um, A Place to Worship, identified also the emphasis on the nuclear family as being an innovation of that time. I think that they were very clever to see that in the moment, because I think that in subsequent years, we've forgotten that the nuclear family is not, has, has not historically been the only way that people have you know, gone, lived. My point is that um, congregations around the country, many Catholic, many Lutheran, but also many Jewish congregations, wanted to have the latest thing. There was a bit of a, um, a com competition, you know, to see who could be the most uh, au courant. And hiring a famous architect to do your synagogue was part of that. So um, uh, Baltimore Hebrew hired Percival Goodman, a well-known architect in New York. Eric Mendelssohn was brought to town. And uh, who, who was more famous in the 1950s among architects than Walter Gropius? So um, he, was con he, he was thought to be, I mean, he, he had a collaborator whose name I forget, uh, and the collaborator feels that he contributed more to the design that Gropius did, but anybody who's familiar with uh, Gropius's design for the Bauhaus Museum in Berlin sees similar motifs, these sort of uh, repeated uh, archways, et cetera. Um, uh, I don't know that Gropius actually ever came to Baltimore to actually visit this, but uh, it was a, a building that was very um, affecting for its time. Of course, the interior design of it fell out of fashion and, and in the late 90s, I think they they tore it apart. So you can only see you can only experience Gropius's design from the exterior. Right. Yeah. 
So next, next question uh, from Rain Bodhi. I am curious about the first Christian church just north of the intersection of Lake and Roland Avenues. Do you have any information about it? Lake and Roland, right north of that. Oh, wait, I thought Lake, uh, right north of Lake and Roland is the, uh, uh, all I know is that that's a housing development. Um, you mean maybe right south of it? Uh, could be, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, there, is a, there is a church that is sort of based on Wright's wigwam designs from the 1950s, if that's worth looking at. Um, I do mean south, yes. Um, a project that um, I did not document in my research, so I don't, I can't, I don't know any of the facts of the matter, but it seemed like a very, a very exciting project. I, I was in it for, a, you know, for a screening of a movie maybe about 40 years ago. Um, but I think that, you know, Wright, Wright's example um, at the Unity Church in, Wisconsin, in Madison, uh, which was a relatively late project of his in the 1950s, inspired quite a few um, other architects around the country because it, it sort of split the difference between the A-frame and the uh, you know and and the um, and sort of the, the the modernist gesture that you see in other ar other architects like Corbusier. So I think that uh, Wright's work was definitely on the mind of the architect there. I love the uh, simple uh, hand drawings that you showed that sort of diagrams of, of plan and elevation. Um, well, I tell you, uh, you know, I found that Myron Ayers uh, collection is sitting there at the Baltimore Archives, you know, in uh, near Greenmont Avenue. And they had everything, I mean, pieces of tracing paper were there. You know, that was a historian's dream and I really only scratched the surface. So I'd love to, as soon as they reopen, I'd like to get back in there. Okay, um, let's see, any more questions uh, for Jeremy? I'll ask another. Um, how does all of this great work uh, from the post-World War II modernism uh, translate into what you see today? Well, um, I'm going to interpret that question uh, with a cautionary uh, word. I mean, we, as a city, we can't tear this stuff down fast enough. I mean, it's, it's to me, quite frustrating. Uh, of course, Church of the Redeemer is valued by its, um, its congregation. Uh, I, I, you know, the, the church in Glen Burnie, since it's suburban and, they're, and it's so car-based, the, the community still is close enough to make that, that building work. But I know that the uh, Harsina has changed hands and the uh, people who, the present ownership, they don't even conceive of that central space as being a liturgical space. Mm -hmm. their, their religious rites are quite different and, the, and they, they, would they would love to tear down that dome to yesterday to sort of save on their heating bill. Uh, but I think they, they've realized that, they, you know, that, that it's, it's all concrete so they can't. My, uh, in, in short, um, many of these Church, the churches and synagogues from this period are under are in danger of being torn down and are being torn down. So right. I'm, I'm not optimistic for the near future. And there's a big discussion point now of repurposing uh, the religious buildings in one way or another. Um, so do you see that potentially happening with some of these? Um, I mean, the, the one that's in the news is the, uh, is the church on Mount Vernon, which, you know, it, it, that seems like a car crash that's going to happen one way or another. I, I, I'm I, I, certain certain buildings can be repurposed effectively. Many of the churches uh, and synagogues from the 1950s all inc included a school wing that can be easily uh, converted into either apartments or um, you know uh, office space. Schools uh, have occupied many of these uh, formerly religious schools. These are secular schools now. Um, but for the big nave, I mean, cutting those up is is wrong. So I mean, until we as a society do what other societies have done and say, we have an interest in both protecting and supporting this architecture, uh, they'll be torn down or, or, or effectively ruined. I mean, once, once you rip out, once right. they go into the Methodist church on Mount Vernon and rip that out, it's not coming back. Right, right. So whatever it looks like on the outside. So I'm not optimistic. Uh, one more question uh, from Jerome Gray. Uh, could you share a little bio of the great Percival, Percival Goodman? Okay, that's an interesting question. Hey, Jerome. Hello from, <laughs> from Zoom. Um, Percival Goodman was uh, born in New York. Um, his upbringing was, you know, he, he was a well-educated guy, um, traveled a lot, uh, mostly in the Beaux-Arts. That is at the time, this was the 1920s, really before modernism sort of took, you know, sort of took hold in American academia. His most, his greatest influence as a child, I think, was his brother, a younger child, a younger brother named um, uh, uh, Paul Goodman, who was a sociologist, one of the most 
more effective uh, writers about the human condition in the 1950s. Uh, and they collaborated on quite, quite a few uh, essays about architecture in the uh, late 1940s, early 50s. I, I, that's a long-winded way of saying uh, Percival Goodman, you know, had some, some introductory experience as, a, as an intern, but eventually struck, struck out his own as a commercial architect in the 1930s. And he didn't turn to synagogue architecture until, uh, until after World War II. And I think that he wasn't a religious person, but uh, the impact of the Holocaust on his view of how communities, including the Jewish community, needed to retool in the aftermath um, inspired his writing on art, on community and community art that was really the touchstone of all his projects as, as an architect. Right. Well, thank you. Um, after that, he taught at Columbia for a million years. So he, I think he uh, retired just before I, I got to New York. So I didn't know him, but uh, yeah, he had a long academic career. Okay. Well, again, uh, Jeremy, thank you um, very much for this great presentation and uh, a great look at a lot of buildings uh, that maybe right. some of us hadn't been familiar with. So let me just, before I go, let me just reshare that screen of um, the, uh, the, the bibliography. Uh, whoops, let me go backwards here. Whoops, sorry. Let me just say that for those interested in this topic, um, Gretchen Begone's book, The Suburban Church, is fascinating and an, actually an easy read because she's a good, he's a good writer. Uh, Meredith Clausen's book on, on Pietro Belusky is interesting, especially if you want to learn more about Church of the Redeemer and its antecedents. And um, otherwise, I'll just make a pitch for this book, uh, edited by Anat Geva. Uh, whoops, got it upside down. Modernism and American Mid-Century Sacred Architecture. So you can uh, you'll, you can reread my chapter, but you can also read about uh, the uh, the church at uh, Tuskegee um, by Paul Rudolph and uh, quite a number of other very interesting uh, topics here. All right. All right. Very good. Right. Thank, uh, you. thank you again, and thank you all for attending. And uh, keep it going. We got a few more programs left. Uh, check out the Design Center on Friday. Very good.